A number system would be no good if there wasn't some way to determine how big a number was or how far away one number was from another. If you've got some complex number that's a real plus some imaginary component and you want to know how big that number is, you just take the square root of the sum of the squares of each of those components, same as it would be if they were two sides of a right triangle. And we tend to think that the size of a number is trivial, and it usually is. If I ask you how big is 25, well you would tell me it's 25 big, that is the size of the number. If I were to ask you how big negative 25 is, you'd say the size is 25, it's the absolute value of that number. Similarly, if you wanted to know how far apart two numbers were, what you typically do is you just subtract those two numbers and take the absolute value. So if you want to know how far apart 8 is from 15, you just take 15 minus 8 and look at the absolute value of that, so it's 7. But this is something we actually take for granted, that there's such a nice, easy definition of size. Because when we get to p-adic numbers, all of a sudden we can't really use those definitions anymore. Remember, these p-adic numbers go on infinitely to the left. So using our normal definition of size, all of these numbers are infinite, but that doesn't really work. That doesn't tell us anything meaningful about scale. So today I want to build up the intuition behind what's known as the p-adic metric. It's the way that you determine a p-adic number's size. The definition of the p-adic metric is this. It's that d of some number m, which means the size of m, equals 1 over p, where p is the prime number base we're in, so if we're in a 3-adic system, p is 3, if we're in a 2-adic system, p is 2, and we're putting this to the power of n, where n is the number of times that m is divisible by p. So what that means is that if you want to know how big a p-adic number m is, maybe it's a 3-adic number, well what you would do is you'd ask how many times does 3 go into this number? And if 3 goes into your p-adic number maybe 5 times, then the size of that number would be 1 over 3 to the 5. This sounds really random, doesn't it? completely arbitrary, where would we get such a strange notion of size? In my last video, I made a comment that in a two-adic system, four was farther away from five than it was from eight. And now we can actually see why that is. So let's look at a two-adic system and ask, what is the distance from five to four? In a p-adic system, if you want to know the distance from one number to another number, what you do is first what you'd expect. You take the absolute value of the difference of those two numbers. But that's not your answer. In a p-adic system, what you would then do is plug that number into this equation, this 1 over p to the n. So 5 minus 4 is 1, and now we need to ask ourselves, how many times does 2 go into 1? Because we're in a two-adic system. Well, two goes into one zero times. So the distance from five to four in a two-adic system is one over two to the zero, because two goes into one zero times. Compare that to the distance from eight to four. The difference from eight to four is just four, and 2 goes into 4 two times. So the size of the difference from 8 to 4 is 1 over 2 to the power of 2, which is 4. This, by the way, is 1. So you can see that in a 2-adic system, 8 and 4 are closer to each other. They're only a fourth away in distance, whereas 5 and 4 are a whole 1 away from each other. It kind of seems like this was plucked out of thin air and there's not going to be any way that we can intuitively understand what this even means or how we'd arrive at it. But it turns out that this is related to something very fundamental about p-adic numbers. It's related to the fact that they can extend infinitely to the left, whereas real numbers can extend infinitely to the right. 
So before we jump into that, I want to mention something really important that I omitted from my last video. And it's the fact that p-adic numbers are an extension on the rational numbers in the same way that real numbers are an extension on the rational numbers, but they branch off in different directions. So let me explain what I mean. We've got the rational numbers, right? It's the set of all positive and negative fractions of whole numbers. So negative one half is a rational number. 14 is a rational number. 37 over 1,000 is a rational number. All of these are rational numbers, the things that we're more used to dealing with. However, pi is not a rational number because pi can't be written as a whole number over a whole number. We often denote the set of all of these rational numbers with a Q. Now, the story that you've probably heard before is that from the rational numbers, we expand our scope of what we think a number is, and we get the real numbers from that. So numbers that can't be written as an integer over another integer. Numbers like the square root of two, or pi, or the log of two. All of these are examples of what we would call real numbers. And real numbers don't exist within the set of rationals, but they're an extension of rational numbers. We add on real numbers to rational numbers. But there's another way that we can go here. We don't have to go from rationals to reals. We can actually take a totally different path, the route of the p-addicts. And p-addicts, do much the same thing that reals do. They fill in all of these little gaps between the rationals. So the square root of two fits somewhere between one and a half. And you could never get exactly to it using rational numbers. And that's why we need real numbers. They fill in those spaces between the rationals. p also fill in these gaps the way that real numbers do, but they do it in a different way. We'll come back to this later, but for right now, I just want us to realize that there's a correlation between real numbers and p-adic numbers. They share a sort of duality, and we're gonna use this duality to construct some kind of intuition about p-adic metrics. If you were just looking at real numbers on the outside, you may say that we're facing much the same problem of defining size as we are with p-adic numbers. Why is that? Well, because real numbers are allowed to have infinitely many digits. Take pi, for example. Pi goes on forever as 3.141592656 blah blah blah. So how can we define size if this thing has infinitely many digits? Well, the trick is to decide which of the digits you're gonna focus on, which digits are most important for determining the size of a number. When it comes to real numbers like pi, we usually define size by looking at the leftmost digits. So if I were to ask you how big this number is, you'd have no problem, it's 3.14. The size of 3.14 is just the absolute value of 3.14, so it's not an issue. And now notice that 3.14 on its own is really close to pi. We definitely have a gut sense that that's true, and the reason is, is because the leftmost digits are the same as pi. And typically, the more leftmost digits of a real number are the same as some other number, the closer we say those two numbers are. So, for example, if we were to consider 3.14 one, five, and then maybe a bunch of zeros here, we'd say that these numbers are close because they share the first five digits with each other. Another way to say they share the first five digits is to say that if we were to subtract these two numbers from each other, we'd get five zeros before we hit some non-zero number. This gives us a hint as to which digits we should focus on for p-adic numbers as being most important to the size of a p-adic number. For p-adic numbers, the digits trail off infinitely to the left, and so we can't see all of the digits all at once, but we can see the rightmost digits of a p-adic number. So the hint here is that maybe we should focus on those digits. Let's look at what happens if we do. If I had some number, maybe two, one, three, 
uh, two, two, one, three, and it goes on forever. Maybe this is a five attic number. And I wanted to construct something that I thought was close to this number, another infinitely long to the left number. Uh, I might say two, one, three, two, two, and then maybe I'll let this deviate a little bit. There we go. So these numbers certainly look similar. And if I subtract them from each other, I do get zeros but now on the right. So taking the hint from the real numbers, we may guess that the more zeros are on the right-hand side of a p-adic number, the smaller that number is. Analogous to the way for reals, the more zeros are on the left-hand side of a number, the smaller that number is. So let's say we like this definition of size for p-adic numbers, that the more zeros there are on the right-hand side of a p-adic number, the smaller that number is. How would we go about measuring how many zeros there are on the right-hand side of a p-adic number? We don't want to just count them by hand. That just doesn't feel very elegant. So can we come up with some better way to do that? So let's imagine that we're in a three-adic system, and we have some number that is 0, 0, 0, 0, uh, 2, 1, 2, 2, 1, 1, 1 just digits going off to the left. So first, let's remind ourselves what this means in a three-adic system. What do these digits mean? Well, remember, they represent powers of three increasing from right to left. So this means zero times three to the zero, plus zero times three to the one, plus zero times three to the two, plus zero times three cubed, plus two times three to the fourth, plus one times three to the fifth, and so on. There are four zeros at the beginning of this number, and we notice something else interesting about this number. The first non-zero term has three to the four. It's not a coincidence that those numbers line up, because you can think about the powers here as indexing what position we're in in our string of digits. If I were to now rewrite this number without the zeros, what we'd find is that it's just 2 times 3 to the 4, plus 1 times 3 to the 5, plus 2 times 3 to the 6, and so on. And this actually highlights something really important, that we can pull out 3 to the 4 from this number. If we do that, we're just left with 3 to the 4 times 2, plus 1 times 3 to the 1, plus 2 times 3 squared, plus 2 times 3 cubed, and so on. Now, let's stop for a second to make sure we understand that this makes sense. Every subsequent term to the left after our 3 to the 4 term is guaranteed to have a higher power of 3 to the n. So we know that each of them will have at least a 3 to the 4 to spare to give us to pull out and put on the side. Also, note that once we pull out 3 to the 4, we know that this number can't be divisible by 3 anymore, because it's got a bunch of terms divisible by 3 plus 2. This guarantees that the number in parentheses here won't be divisible by 3. And this means that this whole number right here, whatever it is, is divisible by exactly 4 3's. No more than that. Any more than four threes, and you're left with a number that is no longer divisible by three. So maybe you see where I'm going with this now. We can relate the number of zeros on the right-hand side of some p-adic number to the number of times that the base of that number goes into that number, or how divisible a p-adic number is by its prime base. And now think back to our definition of the p-adic metric. It's 1 over the prime base of your p-adic number raised to the power of however many times that number occurs in the prime factorization. That's exactly 1 over this right here, 3 to the 4, at least for this number that we're looking at right here. So what the p-adic metric is actually doing is telling you how many zeros there are on the right-hand side of your p-adic number. And this is analogous to determining size in the real numbers by looking at how many zeros are on the left-hand side of your number. All right, now at this point, you might have some discomfort with this. 
Probably the main one being that we don't actually use the number of zeros on the left hand side of a real number to determine its size. That's not what we do. It's just related to it loosely, but it's not the same as the size of a real number. So why is that what we're using over here? And this is where I want to go back to what I was talking about earlier, where we take the rational numbers and then we can either branch off to expanding them into the reals or into the p-adics. There's a theorem in math called Ostrowski's theorem, and what it states is that there's only two non-trivial distance metrics on this set of rational numbers. Now, whatever metric we end up using, maybe we're using the p-adic metric for the p-adics, and we're using the normal absolute value metric for the real numbers, whichever one we end up using, we can also apply to the set of rational numbers because, well, rational numbers are included in the p-adics. p-adics are just added on to rationals in the same way that reals are just added on to rationals. So it's important to keep in mind that whatever metric we decide to use for the number system that we're in is also gonna be the metric that we're using for rationals because rationals are in this set of numbers. And this is why it's eerily not arbitrary that we chose to determine the size of a p-adic number by the zeros on the right-hand side. Because that metric for determining the size of numbers is the only one besides the absolute value that you can come up with for the rational numbers. And since rational numbers are in p adics and in reals, we have to use metrics that play nice with the rational numbers. So there you go. Hopefully that gave you some intuition behind the p adic metric. Uh, interestingly, a lot of times when people are introducing p adic numbers, they start with Ostrowski's theorem and say, we've got this other metric what numbers converge using this other metric. And that is a totally fine way to go about defining p-adic numbers. In fact, it's a lot more rigorous than what I've done in my last two videos, but it doesn't involve any intuition. It doesn't tell you why that p-adic metric exists, or it doesn't show you how you can make sense of it. So I really like this way of building up first p-adic numbers and what they look like, and then thinking about how we can define the size of it, because I think it makes their entire invention very sensible. In my opinion, intuition in mathematics is this luxury that we don't always get to have. And it's really nice when there's a situation that you don't even expect you'll be able to get the luxury of intuition, but you find it anyway. So I hope you guys liked this video. These are a lot of fun for me to make and um, thanks for watching. So originally I actually talked a little more about what defines a metric and what requirements go into being a metric. And then I also went over an example where we use the p-adic metric to show that the sum of powers of two approaches negative one. Uh, but this video is already getting kind of long, so I'm gonna make it a bonus footage video and hopefully release it uh, sometime soon after this video is released. So be sure to check that out. I'll put an end card somewhere on the screen.